Are you going to come and on his day of fathers? Hey, Daddy. I already hit it. We're live. <laughs> Hi, guys. Sorry. I was trying to add my details up at the top and adjust the camera, but here we are. So we'll just wait a minute and we'll go ahead and get started. So right now we've got about 50 people. So hi, Miss Peggy. Hi, Susan Digman. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Cheryl. I'm going to go ahead and um, just wait a minute because we are a little bit early. How many? We got about five minutes. So we'll just um, stand by if you don't mind. And I'll kind of pull up some things for for pretties so you can have a chance to look at some stuff. Hi, Anne. Thank you. I know it's uh, probably late for you, huh? Anne Wolteis. Maria. Hi, Nan. It's so good to see you. I love chatting with you during the week. Julie, Karen. So this fun piece that I have right here is a piece that I did for myself. And I'll tell you a little story about it. So, you know, we all have these aha moments in our own quilting life where we think, oh my gosh, I really love that. And this quilt, when I was done with this, I was like, I can do this. Um, I think this looks awesome. So not to toot my own horn or anything, but you know, you have that experience throughout your quilting life where all of a sudden you realize that the things that were hard in the past are not as hard anymore. And definitely, definitely that is a function of practice. So all of you ladies out there that are getting the uh, Facebook education, you know, I started quilting more than 25 years ago. I was about 23 uh, years old and I was pregnant and I wanted to make a quilt for my son and it was terrible <laughs> and I still have it and it's, you know, barely surviving. But, you know, I definitely have come a long way in that time and there's been so many friends that have helped uh, change and shape that experience. And so if you have one of those pieces that you feel like is your aha moment, don't give that away. Hold on to that because it's kind of fun to look back on years later and say, wow, that's where I was and this is where I am now. So one of the reasons I have this sample up here, and let's see if we can pull it up for a little closer view. So all of that little tiny micro quilting right there is free motion. Um, I did do it with my ruler work and you can see I've got a variegated thread. These are the Westerly four feather set. Then these little guys right here are the half inch between the lines circles. And I absolutely love this little chain right here. I use it on a lot of things. And let's talk about the feathers because um, I want to give you some just some basic information about it before we start with designs. So the feather set is a four piece set. Let me grab all the pieces. Oh, I always have to reach around all of my lights and stuff. That's why it always takes one minute to get everything. So the four feather set, it has some really smaller feathers. So this one is two inch feather and what that means is that the full feather will sew out at two so essentially this is one inch and this is one inch if you had the spine right in the middle and there was no space so you can see right here I have a space right here one thing that this type of designing allows you to do is the largest feather that we have is this one this is the five inch feather so this will sew out at five inches in width by putting a spacer in the middle, I can make this feather be much larger than five inches. And it also adds a lot of fun detail in there as well. So that's just something for you to think about. And that was a really easy spine. It's a straight line. So it wasn't like I had to have some complicated ruler or a fancy tool. I just had my straight edge. And just by doing that, I was able to make the feather much bigger. Now out here, this is the 12 inch arc. So let me grab that shape for you. So it's just something really simple like that. 
So I, I traced the line and then I just moved down and flipped it over like this and traced it on the other side. And then I did sew the echo. When I sewed the feather, I marked the line first and I determined that the feather would, you know, not come any further than whatever. Like I made sure that I had a space. So I had a reference line here and when I set the ruler, I set it so the edge of this, the plastic opening, touched my reference marked line. So that all of the feathers, every time I made one, it would touch whatever the marked line was out here. And that gave me a really nice smooth curve for the feathers out here. And then you can see right here, this is just simple cross hatching and both of these are straight spines. So you can do this. This is just stretching the feather out to meet the curve, right? But you're, you're just stacking the feather just like this as you go along. That's what it makes these pretty easy. And then you're just stretching it. It's this part that makes it look curvy, but this part is straight. So you're just moving the feather up in order to build it. So I just wanted to share this because we were a little early. I normally wouldn't, you know, spend so much time talking about the project. We're not going to do it, but I brought it in as an inspiration. So when I first started working with Westerly Feathers, I think a lot of people think, you know, well, the feather's very rigid. Obviously, it's a template, can't do curves. It can only do things this way. I have done circles with it, curvy feathers with it. I've gone around the corner. I've done diamonds. Yeah, and I'm sorry, it starts at three o'clock mountain time every Sunday for me. So yeah, not five o'clock. I don't know where that would have come from, but definitely. Maybe East Coast. Yeah, you always have to convert. It's three o'clock mountain time for me, and it's two o'clock Pacific time for So Steady. Um, so I see a couple questions. So Sandra, how did you do the small circles in the center? So the fun and fancy templates have a between the lines circle that looks like this. This is one inch. But there is a between the lines that is smaller than this that is a half inch. So this is exactly this, just a different size. And you would just make a circle. So like you would line it up between the lines. So this reference line, you'll line up the circle and sew it one and a half up one and a half, one and a half. And that's how you use the between the lines in order to put this chain in here. Um, the template and tools are listed. Yeah, I listed everything so that um, people would know that what I'm gonna use. I'm not sewing this. This is an inspiration piece because we're gonna be doing feathers today. There is no written pattern for any of the stuff that I'm doing today. Um, it is Father's Day, so we're gonna maybe have a little bit of a shorter lesson. But let me show you what we're going to actually start working on. We are using the Fun and Fancy collection. Hopefully you guys aren't sick of that because I'm not sick of it. So this is the Fun and Fancy collection. And we're going to use a few of the templates that are in here. We're going to use this uh, Circles on Quilts 21 right here. And we're also going to be using um, the oval. Um, where is it? I can't find it. Oh, here you go. The inner and the outer of the oval and and then we're going to add just a couple of other things and we are, we are using the feather set okay so i went ahead and i made a small quilt because i think that it's really important for you to see the design planning so let me grab that real quick sandy congratulations you got that the fun and fancy quilt sampler congratulations for that so this is what we're gonna work on. And right here, this is kind of hard to see in the shadow right there, but it looks great. Look at that, isn't that cool? So we're gonna be doing this design and then we're gonna do this one right here. Okay, this feather right there. And then I've got a little bit of a different spine, but we're gonna do that right there. And then we'll just talk through some things as we go so you can kind of see how we're doing. So the first one that we'll start with is this one. So I went ahead and I did half and then we're going to do the other side. And then you'll kind of get a picture of how the, all of the pieces work together because that center part will be finished. 
Alrighty, so let's go ahead and we'll get it all set right here. So I'm using a um, 100 weight Invisafil. And let me just show you in the ditch right here. See if I can find it right there. There's a good view of it. Can you see how thin that is right there? That is my ditching thread right there, super tiny. Let's see if we can find it on the black right there. There you'll be able to see it better on the black. Right there, see how tiny that is? So great, it just cinches right in, right up to there. So even though it's red thread, I can just go right on that black and it hides really well. So you'll see that some of the things I may do today is I may double stitch because my thread is very, very thin. So I may want a little bit more presence on the thread. And a way to do that would be to maybe stitch another, you know, one more time around. So right here, there's a seam. It's hard to see in the black, but this is two right triangles right here. So there's a little seam. So that's the center of this space right here is right where that seam is. So I'm gonna line this up and I'm going to use the dashed line on this fun and fancy uh, Circles on Quilts 21. So the pinhole will be lined up on the seam and then I'll get both of these reference lines lined up. Okay, let's see if we can get you a little top, more top down view. Let's see if we can, hopefully that might be a little bit better. All right, and I'll turn it just a little bit so we can get our, our thread pulled up here. All right, and this center line right here too should be lined up right on that intersection right there. So we'll just start on one side, lower the foot and then tuck it in. And I wanna pick the thread up right in that seam if I can. That'll help to hide the start and stop there and make it, oh, darn it. Oh, you guys, you know I always have this drama. I gotta pick up my thread, he's so short. Okay, so I'm gonna remember, I'm gonna try not to use my cutter while we're working today. All right, here we go. All right, so I'll get my, everybody lined back up. And we'll try to pick up that thread one more time. So go ahead and hold on to these threads when you start. These are pretty fine threads. They are poly and they are a little slick. So I like to make sure that right when we start, we wanna make sure that we're holding on to them really well. So I'm checking this position up here and I'm just gonna sew this. So here we go. Now, as I told you before, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna sew this two times. That little extra thread, it won't matter, but it'll, it'll show up just a little bit better. Okay, now I'll take this off, because we're done with him. Always put your key back on. That's my little important tip, making sure we don't lose it. So Lynn, I'm using a Janome 9450. And you know, I, I always want to caveat that. I do like my machine, but I also want people to know that probably your machine is just as good and you can do some great things with it. So don't feel like, you know, it's the machine that does the magic, although a good machine is really powerful. So I want to turn it this way because I want you to see how I'm going to line everything up. So if you can see right here, I've got a little tick mark that I have made, and that's gonna help me make sure that this is going to be somewhat symmetrical to the other side. So it's, it's okay if it's not perfect, it, it'll all look good anyway. There's another tick mark right here, and this tick mark tells me that I want to be a quarter inch inside this stitched line. So this is where I need my spacing gauge. And I just want them to be relatively close to the same, so there's the purple line and see the space. So instead of it being, you know, purple line and that big, it's a purple line and we're touching the design. And there's one last reference line that I chose for the first one is that this outer line would be touching the top 
of the circles on quilts 21. So once I get all those three pieces, I've got one, two, three reference marks. I really just need that for the first lobe. The other ones are a little bit more flexible, but that'll help make sure that right at the top, we'll try to fill up as much of this as we can. Okay, so that's how I, I set that up. So I wanna go ahead and I'm gonna sew in until I touch. That's why we need that quarter inch right there. If we don't have it, we won't touch. So just keep sewing till your thread touches the existing design. And then you're gonna come back. And I've made one more reference line out here to help me know that's where I'm gonna stop and do my next one. So let's shift, let's see how we're gonna set it up and then I'll try to turn it so you can see better. All right. So, I want the bottom of the feather to curve around and touch right at the same place where this started. So they'll float out from the same exact spot. So in order to do that, I would wanna use the spacing gauge again. And the only other thing that I wanna to try to do is stretch out the size. So I think we need to go down one size. So my next size is four inch feather. I think it's this one. Yeah, this is four. And the reason that we're moving down is there's not as much space here. So if I tried to put this larger one in and he fits great right there, but then if I put him here, you're really shortening that up and you're not gonna get this nice curvature. So by going down one size, we have more of an opportunity to get most of the feather in there. So the two references for this next one are touch the seam with the edge of the template and a quarter inch right here. Those are the only two things that I need right now. So we'll sew in, touch right at the bottom and we'll come back up. And you're looking for a little bit of space right here. If you wanna measure that, you know, it's about a quarter inch. It's actually a little bigger, but that's fine with me. So it's not, as long as we have this, these can float a little bit. They don't have to be exactly the same. All right, so now this is what we just finished and I wanna turn the template. I still wanna touch the edge right here at the seam and there's a quarter inch right here. So we're gonna end up kind of coming in over here somewhere, not all the way back. Okay, and now I could, I could just move him over and kind of do a little arc right there, but because this is only so big, he's not gonna push out towards the end as much. He doesn't stretch this far. So if I take this one, he's much wider at the top here, so I can go ahead and get a further little curvature right there with this bigger one. Okay. So let's go ahead, we'll scoot these over so I can show you what's going on. All right, do you have your machine on? Yeah, Sherry was asking, I guess, if this is an embroidery machine, if you're using on sewing, but not an embroidery attachment. So Sherry, my machine is not an embroidery machine. This is my Sew Steady table right here, right? So this is just an extension table on a regular sewing machine. It is kind of a fancy sewing machine. It does have a lot of options and a lot of stitches and things like that. It's a great machine, but it is not embroidery. And mostly that is, I don't have anything against embroidery, but I'm kind of all quilting all the time. I mean, I know how to do embroidery, but it's not my passion. So I tend to kind of stick on the side where I like to work. All right, let's get a straight edge here so we can I set it down big oh here it is I got it okay yay sorry so many tools we're working with today so now we've done this side I want to come over and I want to start right at the base right there at the bottom of the other side and then we'll do this side so thinking about that if I want to stitch in the ditch 
If I start right there, I'm not at the corner. So I'm actually gonna travel this way first to close it and then come back and travel down to the ditch. All right, so. So that'll help close that area right there. It's a little bit of a bulky seam right where all those areas come together. So it's a little bit tricky to get it to move. So I have to really be patient with it. So this will close out the bottom of that feather too, which is great. I definitely want that. So right here, I'm at the base of the design on this side. And now we're gonna use the same technique and put those feathers in on this side. So the biggest one, of course, is this five inch feather. And so we're gonna try to do a lot of the same things that we did the last time as far as setting it up. This will give you one more chance to see how I line it up. Do you have to line it up exactly this way? No. You just line it up in a way that you can repeat. Create your own random rules in order to create the symmetry that you want. And I did draw a lot of my designs on paper. So my first reference line is this outer edge line needs to touch the top. So I'm gonna stretch the feather so that it will touch. And then it needs to come in enough that about at this line right there that I have that quarter inch and then this should fill this in nicely and it'll come in a quarter inch even though the feather is touching the spine right there it's going to sew in a little more than that and it's a quarter inch right on that side so that's perfect that's exactly what we want touch and then back stitch and we want to be sort of right here so we're a little bit below the seam right there all right, and then let's see, we're trapped over here. We've got a loose thread we've got to cut because there we go. All right, and then honey, can I have that four size again? So we're just using the two sizes here. So let me turn it so you can get the view and show you how we're gonna line it up. So the first one, I showed you the alignments. Now the second one, we want it to come right to this spot right there. So when I line it up, I'm gonna make the template touch the edge of the opening and a quarter inch away from that spot right there. And those are my two alignments for this next lobe. So I can just rotate it until I get that. So right there, I'm touching the seam and then use my spacing gauge and make sure that I have my quarter inch right there. So I might have to kind of manipulate him a little bit so I can get my right space. There we go. I think that'll do it. Okay, and then we'll do one more. Remember to rotate him a little because this is sort of like the feathers are laying over as they go out towards the bottom. So make sure you're touching the opening to the seam right there. And then we need a quarter inch and we'll come back in about right over here, which is perfect. So touch the seam and come back up. And a reminder, so you can see if I lay this right here, I'm gonna get just a very, very tiny arc. And I wanna push my arc a little closer out here to the edge. So in order to do that, if I take the, the larger feather, where'd he go, Papa? The big one? Oh, it's over here. Sorry. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. Why are you asking me? All right, so we'll put this last one on. And then I can kind of stretch him. I still want this edge to touch, so I've got to rotate so he will. But this will give a little bit more of an elongation pushing me sort of out more in the block. So we fill it up just a little bit more there. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll finish the ditching on that real quick. Oh, honey, I need that. All right, and spacing gauge is our friend. 
So let's see, I think we're down maybe one or two more stitches than we want to be. So we gotta close the design right there to the center. And then I'll just truss the ruler and just go all the way back to the corner. So as you can see right there, it's got a lot of knottiness there. There's quite a few seams coming in. So I'm just raising my presser foot just slightly. And that lets me get right into that point right there. All right, so let's get set up and um, I'll tie it off and I'll kind of show you those two designs so you can see them. All right, let's bring this up. So hold on to this top thread and then you can just get everybody lined back up and bring your needle down and up. And there we go. So we'll trim that off. So at this moment, I'm gonna go ahead and just pause for a second and answer some questions if there's any. That way people you know, can get a chance to have some comments or questions on this design. So this is the one that we just did. And this has the ditching across the bottom. And for that reason, I made this a quarter inch away because I didn't want these designs to sort of co coalesce right into each other. So I created this little space right here. And I'm probably gonna microfill this area and this area. And so this will lift up and then these will still be lifted up. So that's just how I'm gonna do all of these little black triangles. So, honey, were there any so questions? So, Evelyn asks if the gripper uh, strips are on the top or the bottom of the template. So, Evelyn, that's a really good question. So, let me go ahead and I'll put my ruler up there so you can see. So, if, I, if I'm using a template that is designed to only be used, you know, one way, we don't typically turn the feathers over. Um, some templates are designed to be used two different ways, like the hearts and the back-to-back. -back. So I have actually grips on both sides of the back-to-back -back template and my heart templates, but on the feathers, only on the back. And what is the back? If you cannot read the words, if the words are upside down, that is the back. Because all of these lines are etched on the back. And what that means is if I'm using my template upside down, those lines will cast a shadow, kind of like looking through a re reflection because the line is up above the fabric. Whereas if we're using it this way, the line has no light between the line and the fabric because it's literally touching. So typically I would always use mine with the words facing up, being able to be read correctly, and the grips will be on that bottom side where the words are upside down or backwards, okay? And so that's, that's the most common guidance. But as I said, you know, if there's a reason why you need to turn a template over, then you can just put the grips on the other side and then you just deal with the lines however they are. Okay? Okay. So anyway, so I'm gonna continue this design in some of the other spaces that would be black, so they'll have red. Now, I realize that this is a little hard to see with the red thread, so I hope, can, hope you're gonna bear with me I thought about changing the thread, but I just thought that would be kind of wasting some more time. So, so let's get on it. We're gonna do this space over here, this triangle right here. And again, we have this center mark, which is marked off by the seam of these two triangles right there. Okay, and we're gonna be using our oval from the Fun and Fancy template set. So let me get both of those pieces because we actually need both of them. look around and see if you can find the other oval. I had it earlier, but I don't know where it is. Oh, right there, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there's always so much stuff on the desk. Okay, good, Nana. I'm glad you can see it. So what, now we'll get started. So the first one I wanna do is the one that has the frame. We're gonna sew this oval first. So obviously grips side down. I like to work with the puzzle piece sort of on the bottom because then I'll get a little smoother curvature and I can also line things up a little better. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this line and this line that splits the oval this way on the seam. And then there's a line right here in the middle of the oval. And that is going to go on this seam allowance right there. I'm going to pick my needle up right in the seam, in, that, in the center of those two colors. Try to get it right in the split. And I'll pull up my thread. So I'll, I'm also going to offer you guys out um, happy Father's Day and wannabe fathers and grandfathers and people that act like fathers. So because we're not going to come back to this space, I'm going to just put a little bit of a tacking stitch right there before we start and hold my threads. So make sure my threads are out of the way. And I'll sew this oval first. Okay, and now we can just take him off because we don't need him anymore. He's kind of our anchor piece, but now we'll put him back to bed. All right, now, kind of crazy, you wouldn't think so, but let me show you on this piece. This is the piece that is right here, and I centered it again, and you can see that he's going to make this bigger oval. So you, that's why I like to do him second because he kind of is that second part of the design. Let's turn it so I can show you how we line it up. Okay, so right here, I've got to sew out just a little bit. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll just freehand it because I can. Just enough so that I can lay this on the center and have this center line be on that seam. So it looks like I might need one more stitch to get there. All right, and now I'm gonna put this echo right in there. Now remember we talked about double stitching? I'm gonna double stitch right here and I'll show you why. This will make that be a little bit more defined, number one. And when I start over here, I want to start with my feather on this side. I could start on either side, but this is going to be opposite of the one that I've already sewn. So this one's going to start here, and the one on this side started down on the bottom. So they'll have a little mixy-matchy kind of look. All right, so let's start with feathers. So when we start with a feather, we got to decide where it's going to go and it's going to go kind of right along this seam and I've got to make it so that it can fit in this space. So I'm going to start with the smallest size because that is the most reasonable, I think, size for that area. So let me see, we'll turn it so you can see as we plan. So he stretches out pretty good and I'm going to put a partial. I'm not going to try to put a whole feather the reason for that is I know I'm going to have a partial on the other side also, so this will make it look a little bit more intentional if they're both partials. So, so here we'll just sew out and touch the seam. And we're kind of coming back to this middle of the spine right here. So a little bit down, and I you could mark a line if you felt like you needed it, but I'm... I'm using maybe a little bit more than a quarter inch, but not quite a half inch right there. So as I put the next feather on, I've, I've got to try to see, can he fit? So he doesn't have to touch where I was before, but he's got to be able to touch right here. So right now I can curve it and I, I'm going just above my seam to stretch that feather, the next one, into place. And then I'll come back up. And I think I might be able to get one more at this same size. That he kind of fills up. Oh, sorry. So I did a little boo-boo, so I'm going to fix it right now. I'm just going to go tack it and then re-stitch it. And then when I'm eating bonbons later, I'll fix it. I'll just rip out what was wrong. All right, so let's go up one size because it's starting to get a little bit bigger. So I just keep adjusting, you know, this gives me the freedom to put as much of the shape. So right there, let me show you with my spacing gauge. Right there. 
So if I have a quarter inch as this curves around, generally speaking, that's gonna make a nice return to that starting spine. That'll help it gradually come into that spine. And that's a nice look that I like. You can make it bigger if you want to, but I kind of like that. That's something that I've just found from experience. Now, I want my next feather to push all the way up into this as far as he can go. He can't, you know, go right all the way to here because the feather is actually wider, but there'll be a small gap. So I'm right in the center and I'm gonna choose the largest feather that I have. I like that because he's gonna let me stretch my feather into this space. So see right now, I can't really get where I wanna go. I wanna bring this whole feather over a little bit further. Well, if I was down here, I would be able to scoot the feather over a little bit more. So let's go ahead and we'll just do that. We'll just scoot over a little bit. And now I can turn him and I can get him right spaced into the space right there. So this is what I'm looking for. I'm trying to put this lobe so that he's equally spaced right in the center there. And you can manipulate that to get that. Okay, come back up to your mid spine right here. So this is that back of the feather lobe and this is sort of right in the middle. And maybe we need to move up a little bit. We can judge that after we put the template on. So we'll go back, we're gonna mirror what we did on this side. This is the size four. And so you can see that there's kind of a big gap there. So he would sew into that. So maybe we'll just take a couple of stitches up and that way we can make the adjustment for size. So I'm again, I've got just a little bit over the edge there. Touching that spine and coming back to that midpoint. All right, and now as it's getting smaller, we're gonna pick back up with our little guy. So let's turn it again. We wanna make sure you can see what I'm looking at and what I'm positioning. All right, so I want the edge here right against that seam, and I need a nice return to the spine so I can rotate a little if I want to. back up to the midpoint of that, back of the lobe right there. Remember to turn as you go around, you've got to kind of rotate to push him out a little bit. And then we'll just fill it in until we have all the space filled. And I think I can get maybe one more right here. So just go until you touch the seam right there. And this one is already gonna be quite a bit closer. Um, if you feel like you can't get a nice good fit, let me show you what else you can do. I need that oval again, this one. You can just take this little guy right here and you can control the arc and then he'll kind of look like a feather right there. All right, so I think we're done. Let me tie him off and then I'll show you what we got. I'll try to put it a little bit on uh, some shadow so you can see better and right here this would be a good time let's actually ditch it since we can there's no sense coming back and ditching it later right if we can ditch it right now all right so again this is my low side so my red thread is going to be on that low side so i want to close this side before i go forward and um, i'm going to give you one of my tips, and I, I'm gonna caveat my tip with, this is a little bit of an advanced tip. You should try it, but if you feel like it's uncomfortable or you don't feel like you can control it, then just you know leave it for later. If my ditch is wonky, which a lot of us have that, I, I have that. I mean, I'm not any better than anybody else. If I lay my ruler and I can see that the ditch is going wider or this fabric maybe curves in a little bit because some of these were biased and I did have that. Let me show you what I, I do. I hold next to the foot right here pressing down, but my thumb back here pivots and lifts up the ruler just slightly so that it's not compressed. 
And then if I need to adjust on the fly, I do this with my thumb. So like if I can see my ditch is getting a little further away or it's crossing over, I can just really quickly pivot ever so slightly and that helps control and make sure that I'm in the ditch really well. So let's see if I can do that on camera. I don't know, we'll try it. So I'm looking in my little space of my foot to control that and see how this is getting bigger. So I would take my thumb and I would just push this ever so slightly to control that ditch as I go. Now, here I've got my two finger rule. Don't sew off the end. There's no reason to do that and it is risky both for your design and for safety. Move down, reset the ruler into position and then sew the rest. All right, and right there, that's the end of that area, so I'll go ahead and tack it off real quick. All right, let's... I told you I was gonna try not to use my cutter. I want to, I want to use my thread cutter button because it's awesome, but it cuts it so short, it drives me crazy. Okay, so let's cut that. Make sure we don't have too long of a tail. Now let's go ahead and set up um, our next design. Right here is where we're gonna put the design in. And it's just the circles on quilts and we've got you know some reference lines. This would be um, a great place to go ahead and add your crosshair markings right there. Um, Let's see if I can do it without it. I'll need my circles on quilts. That's the big one. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> I'm a mess, you guys. I'm a mess. My sweet husband, he's so patient. Alrighty, so we'll use the pin right there. And I'm gonna just look right here and try to keep this aligned because I'm lazy. But I should put my crosshair lines on there because they're really awesome and they help you be a lot more accurate. Gotta pick up that bobbin again. So we should be right in the ditch if my uh, seaming is good, but it may not be. So could be really useful to have those crosshair marks and make sure that we make this really pretty. So we talked earlier about going ahead and making this more defined. So let's go ahead and we'll put some extra. Oh, I think my foot's a little high. Could you see it was waffling? And it has a little different sound too. You can hear it now, it's quieter. So we'll put one more. Yes, I did put three rows of stitching on this. And that's okay because this thread is so fine, it's gonna work out great. It's really just gonna help to define the design really well. So put yourself at A. My little pin is right on the center and I'm checking right here. And the other place I can check with the circles on quilts is I can also look right here and make sure that your reference line is on the previous design. And that'll help you make sure that you've got everything really nice. So, and we'll do the same thing because we want all that nice and really defined stitching right there. It's really gonna punch down that batting. So my batting today is not doubled up. It's just 80-20 um, poly, it's Hobbs, and it's awesome. It's a nice general purpose batting. It's not too expensive and it works great for a lot of applications, especially kids quilts or heavy use quilts because it's really durable. Okay, so same thing. We'll just put this in. So I'll go ahead and entertain some questions because right now this is kind of like meditative quilting. It's not really, really complicated thinking or anything like that. I'm just following the ruler right here at the top. Put my double stitch in there. That helps make sure that the bobbin doesn't get dragged. And then this will be the last lobe. 
Now you saw how we use some feathers on the outside. When we get finished with this, we're gonna use a feather on the inside and I'll show you how to audition it. So right now I'm gonna check both sides right here to make sure that this lobe is seated right in the middle, which will make sure that when I get to the B that it will close and it looks good. So let's go ahead and we'll do that. Oh, there's a little pucker right there. So I'm gonna try to fix that before it gets stitched in there. Oh, there we go, perfect. There was a little fold right there at the seam. So I had to just adjust that with my fingernail. All right, this is that second row and then we'll do this one last row there. Oh, darn it. So this thread is great, but periodically it's, it has a little hiccup. So we'll go ahead and we'll just get it rethreaded. It is a little bit delicate because it's so fine. It's way stronger than many, many quilts of the same, um, of, threads of the same weight because it is a polyester it is really strong but sometimes it just doesn't like the spin so so Lynn asked can you tell us what is the ruler foot that you're uh, using Lynn mine is my ruler foot is a branded ruler foot it's the ruler foot that is made by Janome and so that's the one that comes with my machine so just let me make sure we're threaded here I think we are All right, so I'm gonna see if I can pick up that bobbin thread. I don't know if the problem was the bobbin or the top. Usually when the top breaks, it um, doesn't stay threaded, so. All right, let's cut that. And Susan asks, are you just relying on the staple tape to move the quilt, or are you also using the heel of your hands and your fingers to move the quilt uh, as well? Um, I do think, Susan, it's a little bit of both uh, that I use my fingers and then I also use um, the heel of my hand as well. Um, I can, uh, let me show you my hand position real quick. Let's get this back on and I'll show you my hand position and, and how I think of it as I sew. Let's see if we can get ourselves all lined back up. You know, that might be a little tricky to line that up, so I might freehand it here just because that might be a little easier. I want to be right on the line. So that's my triple stitch. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll tack it off real quick, and then I'll show you that hand position with the next template that we're going to use. So now we can just get that trimmed off. All right, and let's make sure we don't have any other loose threads either. So this might get in our way. So are you just snipping all of these threads as you go? Yeah, so I usually do the micro tacking method to secure my threads. Um, I know a lot of people use the self-threading needle. I'm much too lazy for that unless somebody wants to pay me to do that for all of my tie-offs because I tend to start and stop and jump around so I don't really want to deal with all of that. So let me pull the design up just a little bit so you can see it. So you can tell it's very very pretty. I just love the curves on this shape and we're going to put a little detail now in the center with the feather. Okay so when we put a detail in there we need to decide what feather so let's pick two sizes and i'm gonna just start with my needle right in the center there so my foot will be the anchor this one is if the foot is there he's gonna sew that low so let me make a dot so you can see what i'm talking about if this sews in right now, it's gonna stop about right there. The top of this shape will be there. If I put a larger feather in, like that, 
notice that he'll be able to extend much further up into this space than this little guy. So those are some design considerations that you might want to think about. So, you know, if you just want a little tiny curl right there, fine. But if you want this lobe to kind of come up into here and be an integral part of that design, then maybe you would choose something a little bigger. So we'll use the big one because we can. And it, it wouldn't matter. I mean, it would still look great with either of them. So my seams are spun right here. This is a four patch to make this um, star right here. So my seams are spun. So they're a little flatter there than they might otherwise be if I didn't do that. And that's nice for ruler work. It definitely helps have a much flatter start right there. So we will be coming back to this space. So I'm not gonna try to tie it off right now. Just touch this outer edge to the foot. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna center the feather lobe in this design. So right there are the lines of the design and I've got the same amount of openness and this circlet then is right in the middle of that space. So that's how I'm lining it up. So I'm just gonna sew sort of around the curve and I could mark it, but I don't want to. And then right back to the center. And then we'll do the same thing again. Just pivot, make sure you're touching there and try to put the lobe up as much as you want. You can shorten it or you can lengthen it. It's totally up to you. If you want it to be exactly the same, then you might be looking right here to see how much space you have on each side. And that would be a way to make it even. And I don't care if it's even, like if it's a little bit off or whatever, that's okay. So going back to the hand position, so I've got fingers on the ruler where the grips are. So I've, I've got grips here and here. So this is controlling this side of the feather. So also I've got fingers off of the ruler, which are moving the quilt as well. I think that it's important to have both. The fingers that are on the outside here can feel if the ruler is moving because the fabric is, is telling you, it's giving you sensory information. If all of my fingers are on the ruler and the ruler moves, my fingers are not moving against the ruler. So I may not perceive that movement. But if I have it here and here, I can tell if this is moving against my finger and I can tell if, if there's a shifting here and how that feels on the fabric as well. So I usually have at least um, one or two fingers off the edge of the ruler itself. So let's go ahead. We'll get lined up for this next one. So right here, same thing. I'm just looking to get about that same even spacing. And remember, it's, it's not a rule. Nobody's gonna take their ruler and measure. Are you exactly in the center? It's okay. So I'll try to stop right in the center there. And then he'll be, he'll be the last one that we'll do for this. And I'm gonna basically put this same design in each of these areas. So there's my lobe right here. And I'll line this up and I'll get my curve in there. So this is just a fun little detail that you could do and I could put more than one of these. Like, you know, this is the curve. I could chip it and I can put another overlapping curve. You would want to do that with, you know, whatever balance of space that you might have. So let's go ahead. We'll tie this off and then we'll show you what it looks like. lift this up so we can get a nice little shadow on it so we can see. Doesn't that look great? Love it. So as part of this, uh, Peggy noted that you have a lot of curvy templates inside of straight edge uh, pieces. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about what your inspiration was? Is that normal or how do you think about aligning curvy templates in straight pieces? So that's a really good question. I mean, I will tell you, Peggy, that part of the inspiration is I 
I chose to build this quilt to meet the designs I had made. So that's, that's the first thing. I wanted space where I could use the feathers in a unique way and triangles were kind of how I started developing that. Um, the circles on quilts 21 for me is a natural fit for this shape. I mean, it's a four, you know, 45 degree or 90 degree angles and each of these kite shapes are at a 90 degree angle. So I knew it was a perfect fit for the design that I wanted to share. And I felt like this little bit of detail was a really great way to show feathers in a way that you wouldn't necessarily think of using them. Mm -hmm. But I do like to use curvy designs if I have a quilt that's overly straight. I think curves tend to soften and move the eye around and soften the hard edge of a straight pieced product. And so, you know, but it's, it's totally personal preference. I mean, you should definitely do that if you want to do that, if you like that. If you wanted to just do all of this quilt with just straight lines, you could do that and it would look great. There's so many different options. So, okay, let's see. We have one more that we are gonna do. So let's move over to this side. See if we can show you. Let me pull it up a little bit. Doesn't that look awesome right there? Love it. Okay, so I will do it on the black because I think it's going to show better. So we'll find the other black side. So right here, these two black are going to have this design right here, this straight line little arrow kind of a thing. So they're gonna have both sides of this will be exactly the same, which makes sort of this two-tone triangle. So what I wanted to do with this space is rather than have it work as, a, as two different triangles, like how we did over here where the triangles are different, I wanted to create something here where this space was unified by the design so that it could work together. So the design that I showed you, what you would do is you would sew the one side and you'll end up at the top here, you know, you sew the arc and you come down and you do the feather and then you could travel up and do the arc on this side and then do the feather. And then I'll, let me show you an additional little bit of detail of where this is going. Can you see that? So the feather is going to go in here and then I'm going to make a matching feather over here and then I'm going to use the same arc and I'm going to create a cross hatch right here. So both the black triangle and the red triangle will have the same designs. You'll have a, a feather orange peel on both sides and you'll have the cross hatching in the middle, okay? But we're really sharing just how to line up and do the feather por portion right now. So you would do the red and the black exactly the same. And then you can just figure out, you know, how to travel. It sh it's able to be continuous, but let me show you how we set it up and let me introduce the template as well. Let me grab it for you. All right, so this template is not in the Fun and Fancy collection, but it's awesome. And it can be bought just by itself, or you can buy it in a set. It has multiple pieces. So um, the three inch arc, I think, is in our, or the four inch arc maybe, is in the uh, sampler set. And this is the same style, only it's a lot bigger. So I just played with different curves that I had and tried to figure out one that could create some symmetry right here. And this one is the perfect size. So let me show you the first couple markings that you wanna think about as you're getting ready. So down on the bottom, I can't have my curve just sort of come off of the edge, right? Because my seam allowance is right there. So before we do anything, we need to think about our seam allowance and mark for that. So let's go ahead and do that. And you could even baste. I have a little basting stitch right in there. I don't have it all the way around, but it's on the black. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put my ruler right on there and just mark that so that my design will come inside of that seam allowance for sure. Because I want the whole design to show because it's, you know, it's pretty. We're making something pretty. We don't want to cut it off. So when I line this up, the way that I'm going to line it up is at the top, the ruler will touch that intersection right there. This very 
jumbly part. The reason I'm not going to start the ruler right there is because there is a bumpy, messy seam right there. So I'm intentionally moving the ruler foot down here by touching that like that. Now, the next placement is you need a quarter inch away down on the bottom. So that's where you would use your spacing gauge so that you can come right into this bottom seam right inside your seam allowance. And I might, you know, shuffle it so it's maybe a stitch or two inside because I don't want anything to be cut off. Once you get your ruler in place, then you can set your foot. Move it down until the needle's right in your seam allowance. Oh, come on, where's my bobbin? I did not want to come up. There we go. I got him. He and I have a love-hate relationship. He's always in trouble. All right, get your needle set. And then I'll just get these threads out of there. And I will tack this too, because I don't think we'll be coming back to right here. So I'm gonna secure those and maybe cut these too. Get these out of our way. I don't like having lots of threads hanging around. So I'm checking the position right here and making sure I have that quarter inch right there. So this is the arc that we're gonna use. So it's not like it goes orange peel all the way to the top. It's got a little bit of a flatness there at the top, but it'll be symmetrical, so it won't matter. All right, so let, let me show you now as we get started. So now we want to fill that area with our feather. So this is now the space we've created, and we're going to fill that with the feather. So the very first one is the smallest feather, so I'm going to have to find him. The smallest one is the two-inch feather. And let me show you one more thing. So this is the design, right? So this center line is the spine right here, just for your reference. So the, the loop is gonna come out from the spine like that. So this is the, the bottom right here. This is the edge of the quilt. You could do it a different way. You could flip it and you could make this the spine if you wanted to, it's up to you. So go ahead and play with that and see what you like. But what this will allow, if this is the spine, we'll have lobes on this side and matching lobes on the other side, which would make a nice feather. And I'm not worried if the shapes exactly match, like if this feather is exactly the same. Remember, we can make it a little organic looking. They don't have to be matchy-matchy as long as they fill the space. The space will define the feather itself, okay? All right, so let's go ahead. So we said we want to curve out with the first one. Let me see if I can flip you and give you a better view. Oh, it's tricky with this guy because there's a lot of things I want to show you. All right, so obviously the ruler has to touch the foot. That's the first thing. And out here, however we pivot, you've got to have that quarter inch beyond the stitch of the arc. Otherwise, he won't touch that and you won't get the shape. So this might be, at least for your first one, a good chance to use your spacing gauge or your calibrated eyeball, right? So that right there is bigger than a quarter, so we can tip him a little, we can manipulate this shape to get our first feather in there. But we want the curve, so we wanna make sure we try to get as much of that as we can. Then just come back up to that midpoint. You want to back off the curve. Like this, this is a curve, so you want to be sort of on this part of the curve. If this is the center, and then you're kind of splitting that, almost a 45 degree angle. All right, and now what we'll start doing is the, the space is going to start opening up with each one. And we're looking to have a quarter inch. So if you look at it right now, there's not a quarter inch to come into the spine, which is our seam, and there's not a quarter inch on this side either. By turning that, look how we have it now. Okay, so here we don't have it, now we do. And that means the feather's gonna lay over nicely and you're gonna have enough room to get back into the spine. Better to have a little more room than a little less, in my opinion. Okay, touch the spine and come back up. And the spacing here is about a quarter, when the foot is about a quarter of an inch away. 
once I can't make this fit anymore, so I think we can still get one more, the space is going to widen out more and more as we go. And at some point, this size feather will no longer be able to fill the space. And that's when we move up to the next one. Okay, so now you can see we can get that quarter inch back here and we can get the quarter inch right here as well and just tip that a little to get a nice fill of that arc. Touch the spine and back up. And I think I can still use this. I just wanna make sure that I don't kinda of go outside. So maybe shorten that just a little and make sure that you have a nice quarter inch return on this side. And then here, I can either let this be the last lobe or I can put a little arc. Let's come up just a little bit. And I can just arc over to the center. Okay, and then let's flip it around and give you a view. So there you go, is not that look awesome? Let's cut this little thread so you can get a better view. And then, you know, we would ditch down here and then you can put the arc in or you can arc back down here and feather up and then ditch, you know, just plan your path, whichever seems most practical to you. And I love this, I think it's gonna look great. And then we're gonna have another one right here so you'll have two matching feathers and they, they'll go sort of the same direction. So these two right here will almost create a little heart right there. Let's see if I can show you. Let's get in a little bit closer. I'm gonna adjust my camera because I think you'll get a better view if we do it this way. Okay. All right, so as we said, we're gonna put another arc that's gonna go this way. It's gonna be sewn just like this one, but it's gonna have this lobe, you know, this way so these two little arcs right here will give a little heart echo right here at the start of the of the arcs and then this area right here will be filled in with the cross hatching and so that's just some design thoughts and planning for you and i've pretty much showed you already all the designs i'm going to show you for today so let's see if we have any questions real quick see if we can answer anything Fran asked about the Fonz and Porter chalk pencil. Is it heat sensitive? No, it is not. The Fonz and Porter is a ceramic chalk pencil. It has an eraser, and I like it because it's a very fine line. It does leave a little mark that will stay on there, but it, it eventually comes off, so you can see. I wouldn't leave any markings on a quilt for an extended period of time, so, oh darn it, we gotta change our camera, sorry. <laughs> I'm not showing you guys anything right now. There we go, that's better. All right, so what I was doing real quick before you couldn't see anything is that's my chalk line that I made right there. And then I was just erasing it. And this is just the eraser that comes with it. And then I also have like a white gum eraser that I use. Um, this is pretty fine. I'm not sure what, if it's 0.5 or something like that, but it does make a really fine mark. If I have a need for a mark that isn't so precise, then I have another chalk pencil that I like to use that's easier. Where's that? Can you grab that? I can't reach it. Yeah. So I like this one also. This is Boheme chalk pencil, and it makes a really fat line, right? So if I don't really need a really precise line and, or if I need like a tick mark or something like that, then this one's easier, and he, he does erase super easy i mean he, he like comes off so easy i think oh and on the black you know yeah of course it won't do it but but i love this one because he comes off really easy um never thought of oh love feathers in triangles and even um with isosceles triangles too they work really really well and actually i have another sample that i was playing with last night but this quilt does not lend to putting this design in but it's the same designs i showed you already but I just used them in a different way. And let me show it to you. This is scrappy, so go with me, but still looks really awesome. So this is the Circles on Quilts. Let's see if we can push you back out so you can see better. 
So that's the circles on quilts. And then this is the little tiny feather that we just made the little detail just like we showed you. And then all I did is from here, I started right there and I did the feather around and then pivoted and did the next one and then the next one and then the next one and then I just arced over here. And you'll see that what it is is this is the same. So from this point, when I went to this point, I did the same thing. So I didn't have to like try to match the feathers here. This one is sort of the tail and then this one restarts. And I love how that turned out. I thought that design looked really cool, but this didn't really work on the quilt with the changes of colors and everything like that. So this would have to be used maybe in a different space. But I love how it kind of creates a square and it's really full. And then having the center detail I like because otherwise this is all open. I like to usually put something in the center of the circles on quilts because I think it needs that. I think it needs a little detail in there. So any more questions? So Sherry asked uh, if her machine doesn't come with a, uh, a foot, can she order it through Janome or ruler foot? I think she's talking about a ruler foot. So um, Sherry, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Sherry, Westley makes feet that fit most machines. Your manufacturer may have a machine that fits your machine or not. My machine is somewhat new. And in fact, it has a ruler work setting that is specifically for that purpose. And many manufacturers don't have that. So I, I don't know the answer, it depends on your brand, but some manufacturers will have one and some will not. But generally speaking, you can find a Westerly foot for almost every machine out there. We just need to know what your make and model is. So you can message me privately if you want any more information about that. I'd be happy to help you figure out what you need, okay? Um, okay. And then the last thing I think is uh, Lillian at the beginning kind of asked if you'd come back to this oh. uh, one here. What was your inspiration when looking at a blank piece of fabric and what kind of led you to making that? Okay, well, I have been playing with feathers and, you know, I kind of took it as a personal challenge because people were like, oh, you can just only make straight feathers. These are limited. They can't do very much. And so when I heard that, my goal was like, oh my gosh, I, I don't think so. I think you could do a lot more. Um, let's see, honey. I was trying to think if you could get my other feather sample, but I don't know where it is. <laughs> it's the orange one. It's either up on that shelf or might be underneath right there behind. And it's like, it's all orange, really kind of a tannish orange. So, nope. Nope. Look, can you look um, down there, baby, underneath? Right down there? On the floor? It's like all, I have a bunch of stacked up Westerly samples on the floor there. That's okay. Uh, well, I'll post a picture of it. How about that? I'll post a picture of this sample and my other feather sample, and it has feathers in a circle, feathers in a diamond, curvy spine, straight spine. Um, and it shows you that you can do so many different things with these feathers that you're not limited. You can basically feather any shape that you have. And the only caveat that I will tell you um, that I, I think you should be at least aware in the decision-making process is that if you're using the Westerly templates and you have a deep curvature, and let me grab that so I can show you what I mean. If you're using, say, this back-to-back -back template as your spine, okay, I would not use the deep curve to do it. And I would even say that you're going to have to fudge a little bit because this is a little too deep to easily do a feather curvature. So the 12-inch arc here is very gentle. You can see that that's easy to make these conform, and they're not conforming out on the, the curve. The curve is not on the inside. But the deeper that you go into the curve, the more the feather has to lay over into the curve and the more challenging that it's gonna be if you have a really deep curve. So I recommend doing like a simple arcs or that something that has a longer 
length, nothing that's really, really deep in there, especially not something like that. That's too deep to do with the Westerly templates without adding other things to fill in the space, which you can do. But um, anyway, I'll post those pictures on, uh, on my Westerly group and on uh, fabricated quilts as well just if people want to see those for some inspiration I mean they've been posted before but I'll just uh, repost so people can see those so anyway um, hopefully we've answered all the questions was that everybody okay I'll give you like one minute if you have a question that didn't get answered send it to honey right now and we'll answer it and I know this is maybe a little short and sweet for the day, but it is Father's Day and we're getting ready for supper. So we're gonna go ahead and say goodbye. But feathers are awesome, play with them. They are amazing. And you know, you can see I use them of course with fun and fancy, but what I wanna encourage you to do is use them with the arcs and the spin effects and the shapes that you already have. Cause you can make amazing designs by integrating tools that you already have. All righty. Good night. Good night. Have a wonderful night, Nana, and everybody else. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and happy quilting. Bye.